If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have been given tremendous authority to overcome evil. That's uh, simply my message. The title of my message tonight is Resist Evil with Authority. And as we're finishing up the letter that Peter writes to first century Christians who are undergoing suffering, here's what he says in 1 Peter chapter 5. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. And even just as I read that, it reminded me of another, another passage that Luke, uh, the physician, who was the writer uh, of the book of Acts and um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Luke was the writer uh, of the Gospel of Luke. And it's at the end of that Gospel that Jesus uses that same word. Uh, Wait, not many days hence, you will be clothed with power from on high. He was talking about the outpouring of God's Spirit. And when Peter writes here, all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud, but he gives grace, he gives favor, he gives power to the humble. It reminded me of that, that section of scripture where Jesus says to the disciples, you will be clothed with power from on high. He was talking about the power of the Holy Spirit. We've been given tremendous authority, and part of that authority comes from the Spirit-filled life. I'm going to come to that in just a few moments, but let me continue with the passage here. Verses 5, 6, and 7. It's difficult to catch it midstream. Let me read it again. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He shows favor to the humble. He, sh he, he gives power to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your care on him, for he cares for you. Now, in just a moment, we're going to come to another verse where Peter continues and he says, resist the devil. Resist, uh, res resist the enemy. And um, before I come to that verse, I, I want to read a couple of verses that are foundational in, in terms of reminding us of the tremendous authority that Jesus Christ has given to every spirit-filled believer. We need to be filled with God's Spirit in order to be able to function in this kind of authority, this kind of power and anointing. Matthew chapter 16, it's the passage where Jesus says to the disciples, who do men say that I am? And Simon Peter pipes up and he says, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. And then he says this, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That statement is a picture of tremendous authority. Jesus Christ has given to us authority to bind the works of hell, to bind Satan, to bind the devil, to come against the lies of the enemy. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. We can release the Spirit of God to move on people's lives. So that right there is a powerful statement of authority that Jesus Christ was not just given to the disciples here, but he's given to every believer in Jesus who is being filled with the Holy Spirit of God. There's another passage in Luke chapter 10. After Jesus had sent out 72 disciples, they returned. The 72 returned with joy. This is verse 17 of Luke 10. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. It is a powerful statement. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Those two passages give us tremendous authority. 
Jesus Christ, by the power of his Holy Spirit, gives us authority to overcome the enemy, to resist Satan on behalf of ourselves when we're resisting evil and resisting temptation. And he has given us power and authority to, to overcome the enemy on behalf of other people as we pray for them. And I, I want to just give you a list of four things here where authority comes from. Authority comes from being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now I'm assuming a couple of things here. It really is important for you to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Coming to Jesus and asking Jesus to come into our lives. Uh, uh, it's in John 3, 16. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. That believing in Jesus is the first step to authority. We need to receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And we need to surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in our lives. And then water baptism is an important step where we identify with the death and resurrection of Jesus. As we're baptized in water, we go down into the water, we're identifying, we're saying, Jesus, I'm dying with you. And as we come up out of the water, we are released to walk in newness of life. But then there is this baptism of the Holy Spirit that Jesus talks about in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And so that's usually something that happens after water baptism. But authority comes, first of all, from being filled with the Holy Spirit. And I wanted to explain that in full, um, helping uh, any person listening to this that uh, you, you need to be a believer in Jesus Christ to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So authority comes from being filled with the Holy Spirit. Authority comes, second, authority comes from a life of integrity. Now, that's not, that doesn't mean perfection, but it does mean a lifestyle of repentance. As long as we're in this fleshly body, we will be prone to sin. And uh, we will never be free from the tendency to sin until we get to heaven. As long as we're in this fleshly body, we, by default, will tend to want to do our own thing. And so authority comes from a life of integrity. But a life of integrity is not perfection. A life of integrity is continuing to deal with our sin. Uh, as Jesus said uh, at one place, I believe it's John 12, uh, he says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so in that sense, there is a, a continuing stepping into the light of Jesus Christ every day. Uh, living for Jesus is not perfection. Living for Jesus is a lifestyle of turning to him and turning away from uh, our tendency to go our own way. So authority comes from a life of integrity, not perfection, but a life of repentance. Three, authority comes as we surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in obedience to him. There is something about obeying the Lord Jesus and following him that sets the stage for new dimensions of authority and power that comes from a life of obedience, from a life of integrity. And then authority comes from a life of prayer. As we're filled with God's spirit, and as we are people of prayer, offering our lives to the Lord each morning and praying for the people around us, there is tremendous authority that comes through prayer. I can't help but think of an example from, I believe it's Acts chapter 16, where uh, certain disciples were wanting to use the authority that they saw in the Apostle Paul and uh, they were uh, trying to cast out demons, and, uh, um, but they weren't moving in their own authority. They were invoking the name of Paul, and they got beat up, and they, they, were, they were not able to have power over the enemy, and uh, it, it, it was an ugly scene, but that teaches us that we need to move in our own authority. The apostle Paul was a great man of prayer, and the demon said, the Holy Spirit we know, Paul we know, Jesus we know, but who are you? And so it was a sobering moment in the life of the early church, but it is the, by the authority of God's Spirit through prayer. So authority comes from being filled with the Holy Spirit. Authority comes from a life of integrity. Authority comes as we surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in obedience to him every day. There will be an ever-increasing authority to the degree that you obey the Lord, it'll be to that degree that you can move in tremendous authority in the power of the Holy Spirit. And then authority comes from a life of prayer. Jesus Christ 
has given you tremendous authority as you walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. You have been given authority and you can use that authority to overcome the enemy, to overcome temptation and sin. And, and that's the next thing that we're going to come to. The second thing is this, resist Satan and overcome evil. You have the power to resist temptation. You have the power to resist Satan and overcome evil for yourself and for the people around you. First Peter, let me read it, verses eight and nine. Peter continues after he says, humble yourselves before God. God opposes the prophet, he gives grace to the humble. Then he says this, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. There is, within this verse, and I, I need to be careful here in terms of being faithful to the original text, here, when Peter writes, resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings, within the context of what Peter just said, he's talking about resisting Satan in the midst of suffering, because uh, almost the suggestion that when we undergo suffering and pressure from outside, we are tempted to reject God and tempted to give in to temptation. And, and so in this American lifestyle that we find ourselves in, we are not going through the same kind of suffering as the, the first century Christians. But we can expand the meaning and application of this verse when Peter writes, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour, we see that time and time again in our culture. People who are lawless, people who are addicted to drugs, people who are prone to steal. Um, we live in a culture right now of lawlessness and we need to pray for our government leaders and we need to vote in leaders who will uphold the law instead of uh, mistakenly thinking that we can be compassionate by going easy on on criminals. I'm, I'm, I'm going too far into the politics, but let me just say, here Peter is saying, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And people are being devoured by drug addiction, alcohol addiction, deception, idolatry, materialism, he says, resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Peter is saying here, you can resist Satan, you can resist the devil and all of the temptations of the enemy. Now, we could talk about evil, facing evil. And whether you have overcome, uh, let's just uh, assume, for instance, for a moment that you've overcome the obvious addictions of drugs, alcohol, um, pornography, um, materialism. There may be other things that are not inherently evil, but that can become evil if they come between us and God. Any, anything that crowds out our attention and distracts us from serving the true and living God is by definition idolatry. It, it's become an, a too important God. And, and James chapter 4, verse 17 says, Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. And so, if I could define it this way, there are sins of commission and sins of omission. Sins of commission are sins that we commit. And um, it's true that there, for every one of us, there are varying degrees of falling into sin and, and, and falling in, into weakness in, in some, we all have weaknesses and we all are prone to sin in many different ways. And though we may not be addicted, we can resist the devil, we can resist Satan, we can resist evil, but there's sins of commission, sins that we commit and sins of omission. And here's where I would want to define that a life of obedience to Jesus Christ is a life, a delightful adventure of tying into the presence of the Lord Jesus every moment of every day. And in that sense, uh, he calls me to pray for a lot of people. And for me, not to obey the Lord in prayer, praying for people would be a sin of omission. 
it would be something where I know that I need to do this, and if I don't do it, then it becomes sin. There is a whole life of prayer that we can enter into. And I, as I'm driving out each day, driving, I'm praying for people. I prayed for you today. And for those of you that I know would be watching this and listening to this, I, I pray according to what I know that the Lord has given me to pray. But I, I pray for every one of you that's listening to this uh, teaching. There's something about the power of prayer that brings authority. And so with that, we have the privilege to resist Satan and overcome evil. But I've added a couple of other verses to equip us and to remind us of the tremendous authority and the tremendous battle in the spiritual realm. It's a battle of the mind. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul writes this. It's at the beginning of 2 Corinthians 4. It's the first six verses. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have been we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Now, here's the key verse that I want us to hear. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, those who are still without Jesus. The God of this age, he's talking about Satan, lowercase God. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Let me read the first part of that again. The God of this age, Satan, the devil, Satan has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel. If you combine that with an earlier verse that I shared where Jesus says to the disciples, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Combine that with this verse. We can bind the spirits that would blind the minds of unbelievers. Bind a spirit of pride. Bind a spirit of deception. Binding a spirit of lust. We can come against the lies of the enemy. We can bind the gods of this age that blind the minds of our unbelieving spouses or our unbelieving relatives, our unbelieving friends. We can enter into a life of prayer and intercession that defeats the enemy, not just for ourselves, but for the people that we're praying for. Let me continue. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel. It displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. I read that section of scripture primarily to show us that we can come against the gods of this age we can bind the gods of this world that would blind the minds of unbelievers. And then the other verse, which would be encouraging to every one of us, 1 Corinthians 10, Paul writes and he says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. But God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out. The older translation says he will provide a way of escape so that you can endure it. What Paul is saying here is that we can overcome every temptation. You, ha you have the power of God's spirit to resist evil. It's in you to do it. When you are tempted, you, he will also provide a way out. In just a moment, we'll talk about a number of different ways out. But then 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and this speaks of the darkness of this world and how the suggestions of hell can become so deceptive and so subtle, and yet they are seeping into our society that would affect the way we approach crime, that would affect certain lifestyles that in our culture has become acceptable, and yet the, the eternal word of God would call it an abomination. Here's what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 10 in talking about the spiritual battle of the mind. He says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. 
The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Divine power. He's talking about the power of the Holy Spirit. He's talking about that same resurrection power that raised Jesus from the dead. We have the power of God's Spirit to demolish strongholds. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension or every argument that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. All of the lies of the enemy that we see in our culture, that's prevailing in, in, in our culture, in, in, in demonic ways, in, in dark ways, that is setting our culture on a path of self-destruction. We have the authority to demolish those arguments, to come against every pretension and argument that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And we will be ready to punish every act of, of disobedience once your obedience is complete. There is a battle of the mind. And so with that, whether it is in you experiencing your own personal freedom and deliverance from past patterns of sin, or whether it's in praying for others to be delivered, here are four keys to how to resist evil, uh, to resist Satan and overcome evil. Number one, we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5.16, Paul writes and he says, walk in the spirit and you'll not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So there is this it, 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 beginning point of saying, Jesus, fill me with your Holy Spirit. We need to pray that every morning that would empower us to be able to walk in the spirit rather than give in to the temptations of the flesh. Number two, we need to die to self and surrender to Jesus. Romans 12, one and two, that's that section where Paul writes and he says, um, I'm drawing a blank. Romans 12, one, it says, uh, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. There is self-sacrifice that's involved. And then the next verse, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There is something of a life of discipline, a life of integrity, a life of doing the hard work in concert with the help of the Holy Spirit. So when I say that the second key point is to die to self and surrender to Jesus, I'm, I'm giving you about four different important facets as far as how we break free from addictions, how we break free from sin. First is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Second is to die to self. We gotta die. We've got to offer our life as a living sacrifice. We need to, sur to surrender to Jesus. And then the third thing is embrace the way of escape that Jesus provides for you. As I shared in, in um, 1 Corinthians 10, that there is a way of escape. There's always a way out. There's always a way of escape that God will provide for you. We need to embrace that way of escape. It may be to pray. It may be to read the word of God. It may be to be in fellowship with, with other believers. And, it, and it, it, uh, an important key to that is also to have someone praying for you. If you were to uh, draw from the life of the Alcoholics Anonymous or uh, Narcotics Anonymous, having a sponsor that you can call and that they can support you and, and pray for you. Embrace the way of escape that Jesus provides for you. And then the fourth thing is this, just in terms of it's in concert with the help of the Holy Spirit, but there is something to be said about our willpower. It's not all willpower, but it's cooperating with the Spirit of God. It's cooperating with heaven. And that facet of willpower has to do with the changing of the way we think don't conform to this world. Don't be trapped in the old addiction, but be transformed. How? Changing the way you're th by the renewing of your mind. And much of that happens from the Word of God, the eternal Word of God. But we need to cognitively renew our mind. That may sound redundant, but I'm going to come back to that word cognitive in just a moment. Cognitively renew your mind and align your mind with the mind of Christ and understand that your choices to deny self, to say no to sin, and to resist evil will open the door to a better life, to healthy relationships, and being effective for God in all that you do. It's worth it to do the hard work of saying no to self, to denying self, sacrificing, 
and saying yes to Jesus. And then remember that every healthy choice to obey the Lord Jesus will have eternal implications, eternal rewards. Make a cognitive choice to have the mind of Christ. You end up doing what you really want to do. And I, I want to say that the reward system is twofold. You'll be able to live a better life and you'll be empowered with this spirit-filled authority. As you resist sin, then you step into a new place, a new dimension of authority that, that Jesus Christ empowers you to. And then you know that there are eternal rewards for your obedience. Every choice to obey the Lord Jesus, you will be rewarded for in heaven. There's an eternal perspective there. It's important to remember that. You can resist Satan and overcome evil. You can be free from addictions. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's by the power of God's word. It's by surrendering to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It's by dying to self and surrendering to Jesus. It's by being filled with the Holy Spirit each morning. It's by embracing the way of escape that Jesus provides for you. It's by cognitively making that decision to have the mind of Christ, to say no to sin, to deny self, knowing that there is the opening of the door to a better life, to healthy relationships, to being effective for God in everything he's calling you to do. We can resist Satan and overcome evil. To illustrate living for eternity, here's a story of an African student. For his first sermon in an elementary preaching class, Lawrence, an African student, chose a text describing the joys we'll share when Christ returns and ushers us to our heavenly home. Here's what he says about the United States. He says, I've been in the United States for several months now. I've seen the great wealth that is here, the fine homes and cars and clothes. I've listened to many sermons in churches here too, but I've yet to hear one sermon about heaven. Because everyone has so much in this country, no one preaches about heaven. People here don't seem to need it. In my country, most people have very little. So we preach on heaven all the time. We know how much we need it. That's a great illustration of how we can be so caught up with the material things of this world. We need to remember we're living for a different world. You have been given tremendous authority. You've been given the authority of the power of the Holy Spirit to resist evil, to resist temptation, and to come against the lies of the enemy on behalf of your loved ones. You can resist Satan and you can overcome evil. And I encourage you in these days to search out the scriptures and maybe look again at the scriptures that I referred to tonight, that the Lord Jesus would empower you with his Holy Spirit and empower you to overcome the enemy, to live a life of obedience, and to be a bright and shining light, a powerful weapon of righteousness where you can come against the lies of the enemy on behalf of your loved ones and behalf of your friends, that you would see people come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and that you'll have many people in heaven with you because of the way you've prayed and the way you've lived and the way you have spoken. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the tremendous authority that you give to every believer. Oh, Lord Jesus, come fill us with your Holy Spirit. Fill us afresh and anew. Empower us with the Spirit of God that we would be able to walk in integrity, that we can walk with tremendous authority and power as we follow you and as we obey you. Help us, Lord, to respond in obedience, to be people of, of light, to be people of a lifestyle of repentance, of turning from the old life and turning to you, Jesus, and stepping into a whole delightful adventure of obedience to you and making a difference in the people in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for helping us to overcome evil, to overcome the enemy, and help us to pray for our country, that we would come against the lies of the enemy and we'd be able to discern what is truth and what are the lies that we're facing in this important year in our country. Thank you, Jesus. We pray that your will would be done in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great rest of your weekend.